What's up guys, welcome back to Gluten Free Learning. Today we are using the beam stiffness matrix and we are going to solve a problem with a uniformly distributed load. So what's unique about this problem is that it's a beam problem where we have a load that's not directly on the nodes. So previously we've always had nodal forces or nodal moments or whatever, but now because we've got a beam element that we know can resist um, moments, we can actually have forces acting on the beam itself and they don't actually necessarily have to be on nodes. So we are doing an example of a beam length 6 meters um, fixed at one fixed support on uh, node number 1 and it's a free support, free end cantilever beam on node number 2. And we've got a modulus of elasticity, 200 gigapascals go moment of inertia of 2 times 10 to minus 4 our W equals 3 kilonewtons per meter on length 6 which I mentioned before so how do we do this what do we even do how do we start this problem so what we want to do we want to use a method called load replacement method so because we've always only done nodal forces we need to now consider our forces our UDL on our beam and convert it into forces on the nodes to make it easier for ourselves, right? So um, you'll remember from structure analysis, fixed end moments or fixed end um, forces or whatever from, in our textbook, it's called, it's an appendix D, but um, it'll be different in every textbook, but there's always a chart in your structure analysis textbook that basically lays out load cases with, uh, with two fixed ends. So because this is a cantilever beam, we still need to make the assumption that we are fixed on both ends when we're considering the load replacement method and we'll do the correction later on which I'll show you but um, yeah so from now we want to um, consider our structure analysis fixed end moment so remember if we have a beam we have a fixed support and a fixed support our uh, appendix D if you'll throw on our load here too so if we've got our UDL fixed end moment charts are our, our reaction forces will show a vertical force of okay so we're gonna have our reaction moments of WL squared over 12 on the left positive WL squared over 12 on the right negative because we're going in a count or in a clockwise direction and the vertical reaction forces are WL over 2 and WL over 2 both positive both going up we're gonna have a length of L right Okay, so how do we convert this into nodal forces? So the load replacement says that, okay, we have these forces due to this uniformly distributed load, and how can we convert the uniformly distributed load into forces on the nodes themselves? So we would just actually take the exact same beam, and now we would apply the reactions, we would apply the reactions that we just calculated as loads themselves, because these would be the loads such that uh, the nodal forces that this uniformly distributed load has caused, right? All opposite signs. Now we're going to have a clockwise moment of WL squared over 12. And over here, we're going to have a counterclockwise moment of WL squared over 12. So just a little aside. So just saying, let's just make this a little bit simpler. So we have a beam and we got a a load of P and then we're gonna get reactions of P by 2 and P by 2 right so if we want to convert our beam load into nodal loads nodes that would just be on the nodes themselves we would then say okay that has to be P by 2 down and this has to be P by 2 down as well and then we have nothing on the beam itself on the members so we've just converted our member force into now nodal forces and that's the same thing what we've done over here with our UDL is just a little bit more complicated but these values came directly from the FEM charts from uh, from your structure analysis textbook and they can also be derived using the work energy theorem or um, by hand which is time-consuming uh, because these are indeterminate structures um, so most likely especially in the class that I'm taking we will be given these charts or at least um, the case, the load case that we need to solve the problem, and then we can just directly apply them as 
as loads. So what we've done, we've just converted this into a problem that we can now solve because that's our node number one and this is our node number two. So now we just have um, nodal forces and a nodal moment on nodes one and node two. And now, hypothetically, there's kind of nothing um, on the member itself. We've just isolated everything in terms of the nodes. So that is the load replacement um, method. So make sure you kind of understand that you can visualize that. These are the forces now that are going to be acting on the nodes. And uh, now we can just kind of go about solving the problem like we normally would with regular normal forces, nodal forces and regular nodal applied moments. Okay, so now we want to look at the general form of this uh, load displacement method using the beam theorem. Um, so we're going to have our force vector, you know, our reaction force vector, um, F plus an F naught vector, and I'll explain that in a minute, times our K matrix, which we're all familiar with, and times the displacement uh, vector D, which we are all familiar with. So what is what is this guy? F naught. That is called the equivalent nodal forces vector. And what does that mean? F naught means exactly what we did up here. This means that we've got the equivalent nodal, nodal forces vector with our WL over 2, WL over 2 on our nodes, and then our moment of W L squared over 12. Those are our equivalent nodal forces vectors. So that's saying basically, if there's just a beam element, we're not considered. We're not concerned about the the uh, the fixed end boundary conditions or anything. We are going to have an F naught equal to minus W L over 2, W L squared over 12, minus W L over 2, and W L squared over 12. And this should be minus because we're clockwise. So this is not considering not considering any you know supports or whatever. We're just saying that this is an applied equivalent nodal force vector. Equivalent meaning some UDL is creating these equivalent forces on the nodes. And from our charts, that's what we got. And that is our F naught. And, right? And we know also that our reaction vector, you know, is F one Y. And uh, I'm going to ignore. Um, F1 and F2X in the horizontal direction just because um, we've got no horizontal forces so um, we're going to approximate them to be equal to zero. We've got our big M1, F2Y, and big M2. So that is our force vector. So if we combine, you know, let's call this one and two, we can say that um, Looking back at our general form, F plus F naught equals KD. F1Y minus WL over 2. M1 minus WL squared over 12. So we've got our F plus F naught vector here, right? And now our K vector, or sorry, our K matrix, we've derived from my previous video. Um, I'll send a link here somewhere on the screen. Um, it's just the general form of this. So this is the general form of our for our beam for our stiffness matrix and then our displacement vector is just V2 phi nope V1 V1 phi 1 V2 phi 2. So this is the general form now of what we're dealing with. So we can start crossing off some boundary conditions, right? Because we know that F2, right? This equals 0. M2 equals zero because we've got, if we look back at our original structure, at node number two, it's a free end. So F2Y equals zero and M2 equals zero because those are reactions, no reaction force. But we know over here that it's going to be, there will be a reaction on, in the Y direction on node number one as well as M1. So there's going to be two degrees of freedom. So now we're looking back down at our matrix, and because we've got a fixed support, V1 is 0, Phi 1 is 0, and because of that we can now cross out, just like before, cross out this whole row, and as well as a corresponding column. So now we have just reduced this to a, 
two by two matrix. So that is good. That's what we want to see because that is what we know how to work with. So now we are looking at this. There we go. So that's what we've done. We've now we have reduced our global K into or our global is our, is our local in this case because we only have one member. So we've reduced our stiffness matrix and our entire formulation into a two by two. So for this method, what we want to do, I guess I should have laid out some steps, but now we can say, okay, step one, that was do the load replacement. So doing the load replacement, meaning looking at your charts, finding out which um, equivalent nodal forces you want to apply to the case, and then we need to find our equivalent nodal force vector right here, the F naught, right? And then we put it in the form of F, put it in the form of F plus F naught vectors equals K, and then look at boundary conditions and reduce our matrix and our formulation into something smaller and more simple, which we've done here. We've got a two by two, so let's just do a quick check. Two by two multiplying by a two by one, and these are the same, so we are happy and we're good, and we end up with a two by one, which is what we want, right? Because we're looking at the exterior, guys. There, two by one, and we're good. So the matrix multiplication checks out. So now remember up before, at the beginning of the problem, I mentioned that we have our modulus of elasticity equals 200 GPA. Our inertia equals two times 10 to the minus uh, four, I believe. And uh, we've got our L, six meters, and our W equals three. So let's plug them in and uh, get our stiffness matrix uh, relationship. All right, so plugging all those values in, we get minus nine plus nine, right? Just directly from this guy there. 185.2 from this guy. And remember the slot here is V2, and we got phi two. All right, so now we've got a matrix we can deal with and we can perform our Gaussian elimination. Um, I like Gaussian elimination. It's not too bad. It's pretty easy, especially when we're dealing with the two by two. So let's take our uh, 2 and we'll add 3 times R1 and we'll put it back into R2. Remember R1 is remaining unchanged so we'll just write that out. Alright because we've got 9 plus 3 times negative 9 so then we get minus 18 and on the bottom here we wanted to eliminate I always like to reduce them um, in terms of getting rid of the bottom left hand corner because we can just do row elimination that way. It makes it simpler for when we are reading out and doing the matrix, matrix multiplication following in the next step. So what we did, we got our zero there, which is good. And now we've got 144 minus three times negative 36 plus 36. So now this is super easy. Um, let's go minus 18 over 185.2. That equals zero plus 36 phi two. Therefore phi two is equal to minus 0 0.0027. Remember, it's always in radians, guys. That's one thing to remember. And then we can do some more matrix multiplication. Negative 9 over 185.2 equals 12 times V2 minus 36 minus 0 0.0027. V2 equals negative 0 0.01215 meters. So this is the degrees of freedom, the unknowns at uh, node number two. So it's pretty simple. What we've done, oh, and remember this was just, I just plugged that directly into there. I skipped a step, but uh, I, know you guys under, I know you guys understand. Um, phi two was just the matrix multiplication, doop doop, right there, 36 times phi two. Okay, so what we've done now, let's look back at our original thing here. So we've now solved for the displacements caused by our equivalent um, nodal forces. So now what we want to do, we want to shove this back into our equivalent nodal force relationship, right? Because we have our, now I've just plugged in all the values um, of the length and everything in, um, in this matrix, so that's where these values are coming from, but it is the same thing that we've got uh, up here from before, right? We've got the 6L minus 6L squared and stuff. 
um, it's just plugged back in here into our Siftus matrix K. But I've just put in the values to uh, speed up the process a little bit. So now we've got zero, zero. All right, remember this was just nothing but B2 and Phi2. Okay, so this says our equivalent nodal forces cause this um, effective global nodal force relationship. So what this textbooks normally go F E vector, and that just equals your F1 Y E M1 E F2 Y E and M2 E. So these are the effective global nodal forces. So what does that mean? That means basically that if we don't have any constraints, if we don't have any support conditions, given this load condition, the or given this effective global nodal forces, we will have this relationship. This relationship meaning these displacements will cause these forces. It eliminates the restrained degrees of freedom. So in this case, it eliminates the fact that, that our F2Y, you know, and our M, that our F2Y and our M2 are actually free supports, right? Because we're going to have some reaction force. We know that we're going to have some reaction at node number one for the Y direction at the moment, but this is basically saying here, hey, we've got some reaction force um, at node two in the y direction and also a reaction moment in the y direction because if we do matrix multiplication we are going to see that you know we're going to have some some value there for f2y and m2y so this is just saying that this we have eliminated the restrained degrees of freedom meaning like right now just for a second we're going to ignore some boundary conditions and just say okay if we just had a straight beam with some load conditions and a stiffness matrix K, we will have these reaction forces. So we will make a correction, like I mentioned earlier, to uh, our final result that will then correct the fact that we've assumed that there will be some reaction forces in the Y direction and moment at node number two. Multiply this out and get our effective global nodal forces, which is the desired force displacement relationship. Desired meaning, yeah, if we can, uh, just for now, ignore the fact that we've got a free, free uh, a cantilever beam at node number two. So, matrix multiplication says, now I'm just gonna write down the values here because I know you guys know how to do matrix multiplication and this is what we should get. So you get nine, 45, minus nine, and 45. All right, so this is the effective global nodal forces. Again, meaning that if we don't think of uh, the beam as a cantilever, if we think of it as just a regular beam that is going to be resisting in the Y and the moment, like if we were doing a fixed, fixed um, support system, this is what the effective beam will look like. The effective, uh, the effective uh, global node force vector is going to look like. So now if we remember the general relationship from before, we're basically saying that we've got a reaction of nine positive moment, that's 9, a positive moment of 45, positive moment of 45. Right, so this is basically what our beam looks like right now with the, this is the effective global nodal forces. So these effective nodal forces are being applied to our beam, but now we need to make the correction because originally we've said that we've got F plus F naught equals KD, right? And we've said, okay, we know that F naught, that just equals our equivalent nodal forces, right? So what did that mean again? Just a reminder, to recap, the equivalent nodal forces just mean this here. It means the nodal forces applied on our cantilever beam due to the, um, the distributed load from the charts that we read. So that's what the nodal forces are. Those are the equivalent nodal forces, right? So we know what that is. Okay, that's good. Um, our K, we know what the K is. It is literally shoot, do, do, right here. We plug this in and we found, uh, we know what our EI over, over L cubed is. It's 185.2. This is our stiffness matrix. 
and then our displacement vector, that's what we just found. That was up here, right? We just found that. So we have everything except for big F. Big F, remember, is the reaction force vector. So what we need to do, we need to isolate for, for F. So we can now say that our F vector, this is what we're looking for. This is the final, the final solution here because we want to find the reaction vector. So this says that K D minus F naught, right? And if you remember, or if, we, if you just look, um, we can start plugging our values because our KD is the product of our stiffness matrix times our displacement vector, which we've already found. And we've just said that that equals our, our uh, effective global noble forces, right? So we have all of the information that we need to solve for our reaction forces. So we can rewrite this saying, F1Y, M1, this equals, right, because uh, we look back up here, this is the same as do, 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 this guy, right? And if we subtract the nodal forces, remember back at our, at our chart, we had our equivalent nodal forces, right? And we know that WL over 2 minus minus 9, so that's minus 9, right? So then therefore we've got... 18, 54, and 0, and 0. Which makes total sense, right? Because we've got um, we've got a cantilever beam, so there's going to be no reaction force. Another 9, another 9 kilonewton meter moment, and then we have thrown in a 9 there, and our 45, right? So then this and this cancel, the 9 and the 9 cancel, so then we get nothing at uh, then we get nothing there, right? Which makes total sense, and that's basically it. That's all that we do. So let's just take a little quick recap at our forces or at our steps here. So we've got a cantilever beam here. We want to find out the uh, reaction forces using the beam stiffness matrix. So what we do, we need to find uh, the load replacement using the the FEM charts, which we've done and usually be given to you, and apply those node replacements and call that the equivalent nodal force vector, which is our F naught. So this is saying that we've applied these vectors, or this vector, these forces on these uh, two nodes. So rewriting that, we can show F naught equals this vector here, and then put it into the form of F naught, or F plus F naught from our general form, um, F plus F naught equals KD, which is the equivalent nodal force vector plus our reaction force, reaction force vector equals KD. We can uh, see that we have a fixed support at node number one. So V naught or V one and phi one equals zero. Cross those out, get a two by two matrix, just like we've done 158 times before. Um, putting in our material properties, we can solve for our displacements V two phi two. Get those, plug them back in. We get our effective global nodal forces. So the effective global nodal forces is important. This is a, kind of the the big difference um, in this method and the previous method. So this says that we've eliminated restrained degrees of freedom, meaning that we've approximated, we've assumed that we've got a fixed, fixed support. And these this is a relationship that we will have given a fixed, fixed support. So we get our equivalent global nodal force vector, Fe. And now we want to apply the correction, right? We want to do the correction of our general formation, F plus F naught equals KD. And we've already solved for KD because this is the same as our FE vector. And then we want to solve for our force, plug in our values, and get our reaction forces at the nodes. And this is it. This is what we have. And this is what we are left with. So, um, yeah, it's kind of, I don't know, it's a little confusing, the effective nodal force vector is I think kind of conceptually a little bit confusing but I mean it kind of makes sense once you go step by step through the example and uh, try other examples and kind of see how and see what changes with different scenarios so yeah I recommend just reading your textbook if you don't understand or watch this video again and uh, also check out my beam relationship uh, video where I kind of explain um, why we can do this and the beam properties 
of uh, now that we can resist a moment. So we can actually have loads on the beam instead of just nodal um, forces as we were doing before. And now we have three degrees of freedom per each node.